That's true. That's true.
about time to start, so I'm going to just kick things off if it's all, if it's all right. I'm Pastor Tim Oslo, the pastor here at Hope of Shannon. They're the worst spot there, aren't I? That's not too good. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. That I, 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 you maybe saw them when you came in, but there are restrooms in the back this way, and then you would go to the right. Uh, after our first session is over, if you can stay for lunch, we hope you can. Um, you make an immediate right out of the narthex here, go through the doors and downstairs, and the fellowship hall is where we'll, we'll be eating. If stairs are a challenge for people, you can drive around, and there's a ground level entrance uh, down on this side, so you're free to come in uh, either, either way. And then if there are any uh, children, we also have someone downstairs who's uh, going to be watching the children. I think they had some, some uh, children's creation videos kind of teed up for them, and so that should be fun. And I don't, oh, there she is. Just raise, raise your hand, Ms. Tomsky. So, we have some videos, some games, some crafts, so we've got these two, and we'll head on down. If anybody comes in, I don't know, this is like saying, hey, you can keep your kids downstairs. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. Boy, just to, uh, start with something that seems totally unrelated. Most of us are, are watching the news. So you all saw on the news how Israel bombed a hospital and killed 500 people. Until the facts come out, and you see that not, things are not what they appear to be. And I, I'll tell you, I'm just becoming aware, even at my advanced stage, more and more, how the, the narrative that we are told about our origins and where things come from, uh, it's uh, how prevalent and how, how, how it's just creeps into every line of thinking. And I'm discovering the older I get, the more important it is uh, to have a clear view of origin. So that's why we appreciate people that not only explore the beauty of what God has done, but also are willing to, to share what they know and what they've learned with us and equip us better to be able to have those conversations with others. So we are very honored today to have Dr. Gary Lockler, who's been a professor in computer science yes. and IT uh, since 1986, is that right? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. <laughs> up here at uh, uh, Concordia, Wisconsin, up in Mequon, and uh, what, a, what a coup it is for us that we were able to snare you and drag you down here to be able to share with us. So uh, I would like to, to welcome you and uh, we'll turn things over. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor. If you did not get a handout, there are some handouts out there. That's the only way to know when he's getting close to the end. Okay, <laughs> So you'll probably want to be sure to take one of those, too. As Pastor mentioned, I am professor of computer science at Concordia University of Wisconsin since a long time ago. But even more importantly to me, my wife Karen, who's here with me, we have five children and ten grandchildren that keep us busy. I want you to know my wife gave me some good advice. She said, dear, listen, this time I want you to be a little different. Don't be too intellectual. Don't try to be too witty. Don't try to be too charming. Just be yourself. <laughs> Following uh, one of my mentors at Concordia University of Wisconsin, the sainted Reverend Dr. John Seleska, always began his presentations with stanzas of a hymn. And I think that's a wonderful way to begin. So I will not sing for you, but I just let me just read to you two stanzas of this hymn. We sing the almighty power of God who bade the mountains rise who spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines too at his command and all the stars obey. We sing the goodness of the Lord who fills the earth with food who formed his creatures by a word and then pronounced them good. I don't know if you've noticed uh, when you're singing hymns on a Sunday morning or whenever you're at worship, how many of our hymns do relate to God as creator? It's an important treasure of the church. Before I get too far, I need to tell you two important things about me, your presenter. 
First of all, I don't know everything. And secondly, I make mistakes. I start off my classes this way and usually have three people want a refund right away. <laughs> and I say, it's okay, I've been working at this a while, I'm trying to reduce the mistakes, and I'm trying to learn more. But anybody who claims that they do know everything about any subject is either themselves mistaken or trying to fool you. Important question that we'll be looking at both at this presentation and if you're up to it, the one after lunch is, where did everything come from? What about the origin of the universe? What about the origin of life, diverse life, human beings? What an important and fundamental question. Some people don't spend enough time thinking about it explicitly, but it really is in the back of everyone's mind and it's something that is there and colors really everything that they do. When it comes right down to it, there are only two possibilities for origins. Either everything appeared naturally, what we'll call the grand theory of evolution, or things were created by intelligent design through supernatural means. That's it. There are lots of little subfields of each of those, but when it comes right down to it, origins is either things develop naturally, we'll call evolution, things were created supernaturally that we'll call creation. And I appreciate Pastor with the news article, yeah. When you pay attention to the news, you're going to get oftentimes, unfortunately, a slanted view. Here's our good friend, uh, evolutionary scientist, Bill Nye. Sometimes I do wear a bow tie, but everybody says, you no, okay. Bill Nye, if you don't know, has said some things about creation. I better get it right here. Bill Nye has declared creation is bad for science, bad for education, bad for children, and therefore bad for society in general. According to Bill Nye, creation is an inane, unreasonable fairy tale. Richard Dawkins, one of the leading spokespersons for the evolutionary model, a British, uh, British biologist, he has declared, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, insane or wicked. So which one are you? Again, according to Bill Nye and both Richard Dawkins, if you accept creation, you're like an unreasonable person. On the other hand, God himself has declared creation is true and a reasonable explanation for origins did you ever stop to think, is it just a coincidence that the very first book of the Bible, the very first chapter of that first book, and that very first verse is a statement of origin? Where did we come from? God has declared that creation is a very reasonable idea. As Christians, we do look at this book as God's word and something extremely important. LCMS has a statement about God's word, and I'm so thankful for those church bodies that do have a powerful statement about the importance of God's word. This is the LCMS statement on the Bible. Since the Holy Scriptures are the word of God, it goes without saying that they contain no errors or contradictions but they are in all their parts and words the infallible truth, and in those parts which treat historical, geographical, and other secular matters, they are true. John 10, Scripture cannot be broken. If you are part of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, did you know that the LCMS has a doctrinal statement on creation? Look it up. This is what it says. We teach that God has created heaven and earth, 
and that in the manner and in the space of time recorded in Holy Scriptures, especially Genesis 1 and 2. Namely, by his almighty creative word and in six days. We reject every doctrine which denies or limits the work of creation as taught in Scripture. goes on to say, today that's obstentious, uh, that is evolution. We accept God's own record with full confidence and confess with Luther's catechism. I believe that God has made me and all creatures. Now, so far, if you are already a Christian and you say, yeah, I understand creation already. Well, we say, absolutely. This is reasonable. We accept creation because God's word declares it as a fact. This is what Isaiah says, recording God's own words in Isaiah 45. It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hand stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. So, of course, for Christians, this is very reasonable. But what about the honest skeptic? The honest skeptic is out there, does not necessarily accept God's word as any kind of authority, and the honest skeptic is willing to listen, but he wonders, why should I listen to you? What do you have to bring to it? Now, if you don't know, this is no reason for you. This is Chuck Norris, and I do a whole Chuck Norris stick in class, so sorry. Uh, this is my representation of the honest skeptic. But if you think about it, if our goal is to reach society with the gospel, I believe that sometimes we need to do some pre-evangelism. We need to ensure that they are willing to listen to anything that we have to say. How do we reach the honest skeptic with the truth of God's word? Most people, if you haven't noticed, have little understanding of the Bible. If you say Adam and Eve, they may not know what you're talking about. Noah's flood, what is that? The Christmas story, is that something from MasterCard? I don't know, okay? So how can we connect to these people? If you're gonna bring up a 2,000 year old book and say this is the truth, what are we gonna do to connect to them? I'm gonna offer that we do have something in common with everyone else. And that's the creation. You know, I mentioned honest skeptics really don't know <laughs> much. Uh, some Christians don't know either. The other day, uh, I was overhearing a couple at our church where the little girl came up to them after Sunday school, and the mother asked, what did you learn about in Sunday school today, dear? She said, oh, we learned all about the creation. Cool. Tell me what happened. Well, you see, first God created a man. And then he looked really carefully and he said, you know, I could do better than that. So he created a woman. So even sometimes Christians don't know the story. But how can we connect with the honest skeptic? What is more universal than the creation? Whether it's planets or puppies, this is all part of the creation. Or what my wife and I were commenting on on the beautiful drive up here is the fantastic trees this autumn. Everyone can relate to God's creation. And God himself mentions this, right? Paul writes to the Romans, the church in Rome, his attributes, God's attributes have been clearly perceived since the creation in the things that have been made. So for the honest skeptic, we can provide a number of positive evidences that will help him see what is happening here. If you don't remember too much about what I'm saying today, I hope you take this with you. Creation is reasonable. Creation is a reasonable position on origins. This is something key to share with the skeptic. When you really understand evolution, you say, 
that, that is unreasonable. The idea of a powerful intelligence creating things, that is totally legit and very reasonable. I love this verse from Philippians 4, translated a little differently in the ESV. Paul says to the Philippians, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. We're going to present creation as apologetic, but we want to do it in a reasonable way. This is what I'm going to suggest. If you want to share creation with the honest skeptic, I suggest that you present positive evidences for creation, present God's creative activity in a positive way, rather than attacking evolution. Now, there's nothing wrong with attacking evolution, and it is in some ways easy to do. But I think our first approach ought to be to present it, our side, in a positive sense. Nobody's going to listen to you if the first words out of your mouth are attacking their position, even if it is wrong. Right? Let me give you an example. A little while ago, there was a custody trial, and the judge asked the little boy, would you like to go live with your father? The little boy said, no, he beats me. Would you like to go live with your mother? No, she beats me. Well, I don't know. The little boy pipes up, I'd like to live with the Chicago Bears. They can't beat anybody. <laughs> if those are your first words out to a Bears fan, you have not set yourself up to have a good interaction with them, have you? Exactly. So I'm just going to remind you, when we present the evidence for God's creation, we'll do so in a positive sense. Now, you've noticed I've been using this word evidence. As a scientist, you cannot prove any idea, any model of origins. As a matter of fact, I was a chemist, not like Dr. Funk here, but I was a chemist at one time too. Even in operation science, there is no such thing as proof. There's certainly no proof when we deal with historic things. So the best we can do is uncover evidences and present a strong case as might happen in a court of law. In a court of law, or with evidences in general, the facts, the evidences, never speak for themselves. Evidence has to be interpreted. If you go to a court of law, the reason we have attorneys is to help understand what all these facts are all about. The debate between evolution and creation is not over facts. I've got the same fossils that my evolutionary colleagues have. It's not over the facts. It's over the interpretation of those facts. For example, oh, I forgot to bring my, well, I have it. I just have, I forgot to get my laser pointer. Okay, you'll just have to pretend I can show you something here. If you look at this, what do you see? Some people see one thing and other people see something else. And if your eyes are as bad as mine, you could barely make that out at all. Anybody want to offer, what do you see? Anybody tell me something? A woman, A woman yes. And how old is this woman? Older, older woman. Mm -hmm. I see an older woman and her face is tilted down and you see a huge nose and a mouth. Okay, good. Anybody see something different than an old woman with her head down? A young woman. And she's turned away from us. And that thing that originally we thought was her nose is actually her cheek. I wonder, is this happening here? Okay, oh, this works. How about that? Technology. I hate technology. So if you see an old woman, this is her eye. Here's her mouth. She's looking down this way. Here's her big nose. Or you might see a younger woman. Here, she, her head is turned away. This is her jawline here and her cheeks here and her dainty nose and eyelid looking that way. We all have the same evidence. What makes the difference is how you view the evidence. Okay? Is this one easier? It's not funny. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I know some of you have seen these before. When you see this, this might look like a duck. If you think it's a duck, then this is its big bill. Its eyeball, it's looking this way, right? Back of its head here. Or if you think it's a bunny rabbit, here's its mouth and it's looking this way and those are its long ears heading back out there, right? All scientists have exactly the same evidence. I look at the same basalt as my evolutionary colleagues do, the same fossils, the same stars. The difference is the interpretation. So the question is, which is a better or more reasonable interpretation? I'm going to share with you four different evidences drawn from four different areas I'm not expecting you to remember these. I will tell you, I would encourage you to latch on to one. It doesn't have to be any of these, but just find one evidence that you like that you can share with other people. I teach a course at Concordia University, Wisconsin, called Cosmogony, which is a big term to make me sound important. Cosmogony is the science of origins. And in that class, we talk about the evolution model, and we talk about the creation model. I want everybody to understand both ideas well. I firmly believe there is no way you could really be equipped for the battle here if you don't know what both sides are saying. So, origin of the universe. Evolution says this happened naturally through just natural processes over long periods of time. The creation model says this was designed using plan and purpose. So the question is, which is a more reasonable explanation for these things? Well, let me just give you one evidence for the origin of the universe under the general heading of design. Design always indicates plan and purpose. If you have design, you must have had a designer. Design always comes from a designer. Ah. Now, my students have no idea what this is. This is a transistor radio. I tell them it's sort of like an iPod, and they don't know what that is either. So now I don't even know what to tell them anymore. But in the bad old days, we used to have to manually tune to stations, either radio or television. And in between was a lot of static. And finally, you get to the point where you can just pick up that radio station or just pick up that television station. Did you know that there are thousands of parameters and conditions that are just right my evolutionary colleagues say, what a coincidence. There are so many thousands of things that are just right for the universe to exist and have life in it. I say those are evidence of design, finely tuned. If you walk into, well, <clears throat> I, my wife keeps, stay to your script here. Otherwise, we'll never get out on time. Okay. <laughs> Think about objects in the solar system. The distances between the Earth and the Sun. Do you know that astronomers say the Earth is in what we call the Goldilocks zone? I'm not kidding. That's the habitable habit. That's the place where we can live. <laughs> if the Earth were closer, it'd be too hot. If this were Venus, it'd be really hot today. If the Earth were a little further away, if this were Mars, it'd be too cold. Yeah, there are planets, we think, around other stars. Most of them are not habitable. They are too hot, too cold. So the distance from the Earth to the Sun is just right. The distance between the Moon and the Earth is just right. And by the way, it is vital to have one Moon circling a life, circling a planet with life on it. One of the things the moon does is it causes tides. Tides are extremely important to cleanse the tidal basins. 
Most of the oxygen on planet Earth is made by phytoplankton and other little creatures, many of them who live in the tidal basins. Those need to be cleansed. If the moon were further away, if it were 15% further away, the tides would not be strong enough each day to cleanse the tidal basins. If the moon were 15% closer, the tides would be enormous. Twice a day, California would be underwater. You say, no big deal. Okay. Uh, I am a California native, so it does bother me a little bit. Okay. What are we talking about? Things look like they were designed. You could say, oh, one, two, 20 things. That's a coincidence. But as soon as you start talking about hundreds and thousands of things, suddenly the coincidence idea goes away. Our atmosphere is unique, as far as we know, in the entire universe. It's certainly unique in our solar system. Our atmosphere is just right, just the right composition, just the right size, to prevent harmful radiation from coming through, but allowing good radiation, the heat and light comes through, but not a whole lot of the UVB, etc. that's good. It appears as if the atmosphere was designed for us. See, I got ahead of myself. The moon is very important, for not only for tides, but did you know that the rocks on the moon are extremely different than rocks on Earth? Extremely different. That has confounded my evolutionary colleagues because most origin theories for the moon are the moon coming from the Earth type of thing. But it is extremely different, and it looks like those rocks were designed to reflect sunlight well. Oh, that might be important. <laughs> I do teach science at Concordia University, and I usually like to start off a class with, you know, easy questions. So I said, okay, class, which is further away from Wisconsin, Florida or the moon? I had one student say, duh, can you see Florida from here? Okay, you have to stop me on this because as a physical chemist, I would love to talk to you all day about the unique properties of water. Water is very different from any other compound on planet Earth at normal temperatures and pressures. When water goes through a phase change from, see, here he's doing it. When water freezes, it does something weird. It expands, its density decreases. Ice floats. Is that important? Absolutely. If water behaved like every other compound that we know, such that when it froze, it sunk to the bottom, pretty soon our lakes would freeze solid. The twin lakes would be ice, even in summer. How can that be? Well, the ice would be at the bottom of the lake, radiant energy of the sun couldn't reach it after a while. We need liquid water for life. It's interesting that water has that property, isn't it? Just sort of, uh, no, it looks like it was carefully designed for life. You take a look at biological transport mechanisms, water in your body, yeah, its unique properties are designed for us. Here's the point. There are really no coincidences. If you walked into Best Buy, and I think we still have brick and mortar stores called Best Buy, is that really true? Okay. You don't buy everything online, do you? Okay. So you walk in Best Buy and here the uh, Packers Bears game is on, and you say, that's weird. How it just randomly happened, all those, they, somebody set them. No, you know that somebody purposely set those to the same channel. Did they all on the same channel, is that by chance or is that by design? By design, absolutely. Okay. Here's the point. Creation is a more reasonable explanation for origins than evolution. If you're a fan of the program NCIS, you know that Agent Gibbs, his common quip was, there are no such thing as coincidences. That's not a coincidence there at all. This absolutely looks like it was designed. Why? Because it was designed. 
I believe that creation can be used as an apologetic. Scientific evidences are not used to confirm the Bible. As a Christian, I'm not looking for scientific confirmation of the Bible. God's Word has already declared it so. But remember, I've got to share God's Word with the honest skeptic. And he says, why does this old book have the answers? You know what? This old book talks about design in the universe. Do you see that? Apologetics is a way to clear the path, to clear Satan's stumbling blocks so people are open to seeing and listening to the Word of God. My daughter, my youngest daughter, is the expert. She has a little book out there. We don't have very many copies of it, and I shouldn't push my own kid's book anyway. On apologetics, I do have some little brochures on it that they're free to take, too, if you like. If you're really interested in hardcore apologetics, or you have a son or daughter at about middle school or high school, this is an excellent resource. She's going to show you how to defend the faith. She has this little ditty called CPR, clarification, ask questions, positive evidences, present your case, and then if need be, refute the other side. We'll say more about that in a little bit. So, you want to share creation with the honest skeptic? One way is to talk about design in the universe. Another way deals with the origin of life. Evolution says this was a natural chance development using the laws of chemistry and physics, what evolutionary scientists call emergent evolution 3.7 billion years ago. I say the origin of life is actually due to an intelligent designer, a living God who created life. So. What makes more sense? Which is a more reasonable explanation? Natural origin for life or God created life? I'm going to share with you an evidence for the origin of life called information theory. Information theory is kind of near and dear to me as a computer scientist. It is the foundation of what we do in the computing sciences. Let me just make it straightforward. Information theory says intelligence is necessary to create information. If you have information, where'd that come from? It had to come from intelligence. Intelligence is necessary to create information. Straightforward example. If you have a book and you pick it up and you start reading it, it's full of information. Where'd that information come from? The only reasonable explanation is an intelligent author created the words here. I could not fool you if I tried to tell you that those words randomly self-assembled in a warm little pond in northern Wisconsin. Because you know there's no such thing as a warm little pond in northern <laughs> Wisconsin, right? Yeah, exactly. We know there's no natural origin for words. Words come from intelligence. In other words, intelligence is always required to create information. No known exception. This is theory. This is science. You got information? Comes from intelligence. You didn't see your phone, your tablet, your computer, or any other piece of tech being created, I don't think. This, this computer, is an information device. What's its origin? Where did it, you didn't see it produced. Could somebody try to fool you? Well, you know, these things just grow and vents in the ocean. You'd say, ridiculous. That's foolish. If somebody said this is created by intelligent people and manufactured at Foxconn in China, you'd say, yeah, that's very reasonable, right? All right, let's really see if you've been paying attention. I'm going to ask my lovely assistant to pass out the exams now. No, 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 okay, 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 here's your quiz, you ready? I'm going to show you something. Let me get, let me, before I even show it to you, let me tell you, 
This is rock, granitic rock. It's purely natural stuff. This is natural stuff, okay? It's granite. How in the world could you possibly claim it had a natural origin? I think that's what you're going to tell me, right? You're going to try to tell me this did not create itself through wind and water erosion, right? Of course. It's, that's foolishness. That didn't happen. Well, how do you know it had an intelligent origin? Those faces present information to you. It contains information. You didn't see it created. Yeah, you could go there today and there's a little museum. You could read about it being created in the early 1930s, right? None of us saw that. But we know full well that it was created artifact because it expresses information. What's that have to do with the origin of life? In every one of the 37 trillion, 37 trillion cells in your body, there is DNA, the master molecule of life and heredity. DNA is full of information, even more than we could ever dream of. DNA is both data and code at the same time. If you did not, and I'll talk more about this, it's really a focus of my second presentation, but if you only last through one, uh, on the table back there I have these 3D printed DNA molecules. I want you to take one. This is a great conversation starter. And I'll tell you at the end, which DNA, this is full of information. Could this have arisen naturally by itself? Neither this model nor real DNA could have. The only reasonable explanation is intelligence was necessary. Trying to explain the existence of information naturally is the same as denying the existence of information. Because the person trying to explain the information naturally is herself an intelligent person. You'd have to have rocks. It's just, it doesn't work. Okay. I was saying, calm down, dear. Uh, this is a much more reasonable explanation for creation than evolution. Yeah, this is my deal. I mentioned earlier, if you want to share creation with the honest skeptic, find one evidence. This is mine. This will probably not be yours. Uh, my, for my wife, it's the horse's hoof. We'll see that later. There's a billion things. Just pick one that you know and you can say in a positive sense. Now, we're not scientists and there's no reason to become scientists, but to understand the creation versus evolution controversy, you should first of all recognize there are different kinds of science. The word science is Latin, it just means knowledge. It's a way to systematize and arrange knowledge. When most people talk about science, they think about operation science, oftentimes called empirical science. Operation science are two key characteristics, observation, experimentation. This is chemistry. This is physics. This is absolutely exciting, cool stuff. You know what? There's a limitation. Operation science works in the present. To do operation science, you've got to what? Observe and experiment. Can we do that for the origin of the universe? Nope. None of us were there. We cannot run an experiment on this. I cannot prove to you via science that God created the heavens and the earth. But at the same time, I can give you, I believe, strong evidence. This other kind of science, and there are a number of different types of science, but what we would be involved with here, thinking about creation, is what I'm going to call origin science, or I just call it cosmogony. This is a different kind of science. 
And you are familiar with it because we see it on television all the time. These are all the crime scene shows, right? The CSIs, the NCISs, the blah, blah, blahs. We wonder, was this person, did this person die of a natural cause? Or did this person have an intelligent murderer that got rid of them? Yeah, exactly. Origin science deals with evidence. Yes, we can use operation science to help uncover DNA and some fingerprints and some other kinds of things. But from that evidence then, we construct models. And the model is a case or an explanation. I can't prove a model. Just like in a court of law, neither the defense or the prosecution can prove their case with 100% certainty. And it's okay. We're just looking for which has the preponderance of evidence, which is the stronger case. And origin science, by uncovering the truth of historic events, leads us to conclude creation. Did I tell you I had a DNA test not long ago? I forgot to say that. I'm pretty sure I passed. Okay. That didn't work. Can I strike that one from the right? <laughs> what about the origin of the diversity of life on planet Earth? So third way that we, we looked at the origin of the universe, the origin of life. What about all the diversity of life on planet Earth? Where'd that come from? My evolutionary colleagues say this all diversified by mutations and natural selection from a common origin. 600 million years ago. And everything is related to each other over time. A creationary scientist says, you know what? God created distinct kinds, fully formed and functional simultaneously at one time in the relatively recent past. So which is a more reasonable explanation? Is this a natural chance phenomenon, as evolution says? Or is it an intelligent supernatural act? which creation says. Let's just take a look at one evidence, and that's fossils. Foss I love fossils. I love going on fossil digs. Anybody here ever been on a fossil hunt? Okay, some of you have. It's pretty cool. You know, I really think that's totally unfair, right? A fossil hunt is totally unfair. Uh, the fossils are already dead. I got it. Work on that one too, we'll make notes of that. <laughs> What's a fossil? A fossil is simply the remains of a once living creature or the evidence of a once living creature. Now, my evolutionary colleagues always put an asterisk there and say you have to be millions and billions of years old. No, that's not true at all. Sometimes I know folks who accept creation are a little hesitant about fossils. You know, Gee, this is sort of the poster child for evolution. But when you understand fossils, you'll see they make an excellent and strong case for creation. First of all, fossils exhibit great design and complexity. These are two creatures that my evolutionary colleagues would say are extremely ancient. 400 million years old. Interestingly though, both the sand dollar and the nautiloid look exactly the same today. No evolutionary change in 400 million years. This nautiloid, some of you know, James Bernoulli, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Bernoulli. <laughs> this is the Bernoulli sequence, the mathematical sequence there. And Bernoulli said, wow, I wonder, is God a mathematician? Mathematics comes from a mind. It shows us design, plan, and purpose. And yeah, absolutely. Or one of my favorite creatures, this is a micrograph of a trilobite's eye. My evolutionary colleagues say trilobites appeared 550 million years ago, went extinct 400 million years ago, none today. Yet, they are extremely complex. When you read evolutionary scientists, they have a hard time with the design and complexity of their so-called ancient creatures. 
the morphological features in the entire fossil record are as singularly significant as, I'm sorry, few morphological fig features. The evolutionary scientist in that article is saying, this is amazing. We can't figure out what's happening here. This is truly something unusual and different than anything we have uncovered. The eye. What's it say? This creature was designed at the very beginning. It's complexity at the very beginning. Life didn't start off simple. Life started off complex. This is a sea urchin. Again, in evolutionary circles, hundreds of millions of years old. Yet today, physicians and other folks are studying the sea urchin. Why? Because of its immune system. What? That thing has an immune system? An extremely complex immune system that many folks are hoping will help them treat human immune disorders. An extremely complex immune system. Look at it and say, how can it be complex? It doesn't even have an eye. You know what? It has the same protein at the end of all those spines as found in the retina of your eye. Today, many scientists believe that the sea urchin sees with its entire body. Is this some kind of simple thing that would later develop into something more complex? No. This creature was designed and highly complex at the very beginning. When you look in the fossil record, you see two things. And this is what most evolutionary paleontologists will not tell you. We see great diversity, but we also see discontinuity. No connections between these things that I'll talk about in just a second. That trilobite on the left, that's a mold fossil. On the right, you see an impression of a theropod dinosaur. Fossils, did those two things develop naturally from a common ancestor over a few million years? Or is it more reasonable to say that dinosaur kinds were created and I don't even know what kind a trilobite is. And those things were created distinctly? Yes. See, evolution would claim that everything is related. So we really shouldn't have distinct kinds today, right? We should not have things we could identify as dogs and cats. We should have dogs and dats and cogs and cats. Did it that time. Okay. Dogs and dats and cogs. And we should have things in between, right? You should go to the shelter and say, what's that? Well, it's something in between a dog and a cat, right? That's what the evolution model is saying. All these things are related to each other. There should be no way to separate things into kinds. But not only can we do that today, easily and clearly, we can do that in the fossil record. There are no intermediate forms in the fossil record. There's nothing in between any of the morphological groups, none of the phyla. It's just not there. Now, evolutionary folk and creationary folk look at the fossil record very differently. Don't be misled. One of the problems that we have with the fossil record is you've bought into the propaganda. My evolutionary colleagues say, see, the fossil record is the birth certificate of different kinds over time. Look way down low in the strata, and there, see, and higher and higher. So over time, we have this progression, this evolutionary birth of these different things over time. Is that what the fossil record is a record of? No. It is a record. It's fair to call it the fossil record. The fossil record is not a record of the origin of things. It's a record of death. By the way, fossils are already dead. The fossil record is a record of death. Here is a clear indication of God's judgment. 
Fossils are formed by cataclysmic water action. If something dies, it does not become a fossil by hanging out on the plains. It has to be quickly buried under lots of sediment. Yeah, that sounds like a huge flood to me also. The existence, the very existence of fossils is a great confirmation of Genesis 6 through 9. And when you look at the record, you say, oh, that doesn't make any, you know, it's not that this thing became that thing, it became that thing. They were already here. They were all already here. And it's a doleful reminder of God's judgment, to be sure. So, when some people look at fossils, and I understand why, it's because, you know, it's just, it just seems, oh yeah, we've been encouraged to do that. If you look at the evidence with a naturalistic lens, if you don't know God, if you know nothing about the biblical text, if you look at the evidence with a naturalistic lens or worldview, well, the only thing you conclude is, yeah, that thing had to develop over millions of years naturally. If you deny God, you can only see nature, because that's all you can see. On the other hand, I believe a more reasonable explanation is the one presented by the Creator in His Word. Do you know that we have found soft tissue from dinosaurs? Proteins. Well preserved. My late colleague, Dr. Kevin Anderson, some of you know about. The Creation Research Society unearthed the Triceratops brow horn and in there was soft tissue. You're saying so? Hasn't Steven Spielberg done that for 20? No, this is reality, not science fiction. What are we saying? We have found out there in the wild proteins. If you're a biochemist, you know that stuff doesn't hang out for tens of millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. It degrades. To find this is spectacular. What's that indicate? These things are young, thousands of years old. See, it's not the evidence that's in doubt. Nobody doubts that there are dinosaurs. Just where did they come from? And how old are they? Well, again, I'd like to share with you that creation is a much more reasonable explanation than evolution. Paul will reiterate, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. If you're going to talk about fossils, you don't have to say, oh, wrong, you're wrong. If you think fossils are billions of years, you're wrong. Right. No, just say, Oh, well, that's interesting. Did you know that we found fossils with soft tissue in them? Really, what's that mean? It means that fossils could not be millions of years old. Oh. Did you know that there's just, <laughs> okay, whatever you want. Those things are, are good. Let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everything. Pretending that life developed naturally is foolish. It's much more reasonable to accept that God created the diversity of life that we see. Science is wonderful. Science is cool. Science helps pay the bills for me. But science has a lot of limitations. Some people believe in a concept known as scientism. That is, science is the only ultimate source of truth and reality. No legitimate scientist accepts that. There are limitations. Tell me some. Well, first of all, I've noticed science is done by people. And the second thing, I've noticed two things about people. They're sort of like me. They don't know everything. They make mistakes. True of scientists, too? Absolutely. Okay, I got all those letters after my name, too. They don't know everything, and they make mistakes. Now, I did start the presentation that way, and you still stayed, so I certainly appreciate that. Uh, the other thing to note is everyone is biased. There's no such thing as an un No scientist walks up to the evidence, oh, just wherever the evidence leads. Famous quote of Dr. Tyson today and Dr. Sagan in the 20th century. Oh, I don't think about it. I just, wherever the evidence leads me. No, no, nobody does that. We go there thinking, this is what I'm going to find. And guess what? Oh, and by the way, I love many people, all the people who are involved in creation ministries, 
But some are so intent at looking for natural causes for supernatural events. I got a lot of good friends that tell me all their theories about here's how the flood began and how the flood ended, etc. And I say, I don't know. I mean, I just, God said he did it. Right? Whether the seafloor subducted or whatever, I, be very careful. Don't look for natural explanations for supernatural events. You run into problems that way. Then you start looking for a natural explanation to the incarnation. I'm not going there. All right. Fourth evidence in the origin of human beings. Is it, does it make more sense to say that human beings, this is a natural chance, just another type of life that evolved via natural selection and mutation? Or is it more reasonable to say that human beings were created by an intelligent, supernatural act? Do you know why Eve was created? God knew Adam would get lost often in the garden and he would never ask for directions. Okay. That's my wife. Do you know where you're going, dear? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <clears throat> I like to call this image of God. Now theologians, I apologize, there is both a wide and a narrow sense for the image of God. And I'm going to speak it in a very wide sense here. What do I mean by image of God? I mean human beings are distinct and special. We are not related to any other kind of life. How do I know? Read about it in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And by image of God, I mean, originally, we had a number of characteristics of the Creator. One of those was holiness, which we gave up when we sinned. In spite of that, still today, human beings are created in the image of God. We were originally created in God's image, and we are still created in God's image. And by that, I mean we have some attributes or characteristics of the Creator not shared by any other kind of life. For example, only human beings use a symbolic grammatical language. This is only found in human beings. Human language is very different from animal communication. Evolution cannot explain how this happened. Now sometimes people say, well, do you say animals don't communicate? Of course animals communicate. Um, my dog knows exactly what I'm telling her. Now whether she does it, another thing. My wife is an equine scientist. She has our horses trained. All she has to do is move her finger in a certain way, and they'll do whatever it is she's telling her. They don't do that for me. Okay. Information and language are related, aren't they? And think about all the interesting things about human language. It can express thoughts on an unlimited number of topics. My dog knows maybe 50, 60 different things. We could talk about many more. It's not just used to convey information, but sometimes to solicit information. We're asking a question. No, I asked my dog, do you want to go out? But she's not really going to answer. She's just going to run to the door, right? And unlike any animal communication, language contains an expression for negation. What is not the case? Every human language has a vocabulary of tens of thousands of words that when put together can form an unlimited amount of sentences expressing an unlimited amount of information content. I'm doing that right now, right? Just babble on. What's even more remarkable is that normally every normal child learns this. How do they do that? Amazing. Just by hearing it. Does any animal do that? No. Evolution has no idea how language began. Language is information. Information only comes from intelligence. Human language, we have a language because God put that into us. 
God uses language. Gee, the second person called himself the Word. I want you to go home, tell your dog or cat or parakeet or whatever, tomorrow I want you to... No, they can't do it. This idea of negation is interesting. You know, not that. Not found in any animal language. In English, though, I asked uh, one of the professors of English at school, tell me about this. He says, you know, it's interesting. A double negative forms a positive. Not, not. Double negative forms a positive. But a double positive can never form a negative. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, right. I've got to stop posting all my jokes online. Because then people find them and use them against me. <laughs> Uniquely, human beings think abstractly. We can develop a mental model separate from the physical nature. If you wanted to teach your dog to fetch a ball and never showed it a ball, it's not going to be able to do it. Okay? We can think about things abstractly without the concrete. I can say round, yellow, ball. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You have that image in my mind. Not only can we talk about concrete things that we know, we can talk about wild make up, made up things, right? Purple flying unicorn singing ABBA songs. I asked my granddaughter what I should say. That was it. And we can discuss infinity. There's an inch. That's a concept that can't be experienced, but yet apparently we understand it. Again, powerful evidence that we were created in God's image. Human beings are uniquely created. Why? We were created by a God who is infinitely creative. Our creativity and inventiveness is unique among all different kinds of life. That's the Antikythera mechanism there. Uh, circa, as far as we could tell, about 2,000 years ago, it was dug up 100 years ago in the Mediterranean, and people said, had no idea what it was. And after really investigating, we discovered this is an analog computer used to predict tides and the position of stars, apparently a maritime device. Whoa, pretty interesting stuff, huh? Computers are mind-like devices. When we find something like this, we say, it must have come from a mind to actually make it. To suppose that human beings, with the image of God, somehow developed naturally, is really foolish. It's much more reasonable to see human beings as being created in God's image. All right, so now you have some evidence, so, so what? Why does this matter? Who cares? It's really interesting. Maybe we get a free lunch out of it. So to suppose, you know, does it really make a difference in the long run? Who cares about origins? I'm going to claim that it is vitally important. I can only scratch the surface. This is like two other presentations that I ever do at any time. Why are origins important? The next time you listen to uh, an evolutionary special, pay attention, or maybe better, when you're listening to a creationary scientist on a video somewhere about that from the Midwest Creation Fellowship, see if you could pick up. Why are they doing this? They do believe that origins is very important. Why? Because origin gives meaning. The meaning of anything is connected to its origin. The meaning of life is connected to its origin. That's why we are interested in this. Uh -huh. So what's the whole issue between evolution and creation? Why is there a debate anyway? What we're really talking about is the origin sciences, that's what evolution and creation are, of two different worldviews. A God-centered worldview, Christianity, whose origin science is creation, versus a 
human-centered religion whose origin science is evolution. You're familiar, I think, if you're old enough, with evolutionary scientist Dr. Carl Sagan, leading popularizer of evolution in the 20th century. Voted the smartest man in America in the 1990s, etc. Yeah, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, when he talked, always said, remember this, there are two secrets of evolution. Now by secret, he didn't mean they weren't known, he meant key concepts. The two secrets of evolution are time, immense time, and death. Evolution works due to death. That's what mutation and natural selection is all about. Someday, we could talk about the connection, evolution's connection to lots of current issues. Whether it is cloning, whether it's abortion, whether it's transhumanism, all these are consistent with an evolutionary view. Why? Well, because they're rejecting totally a creator. All these issues stem from a flawed evolutionary-based worldview. Uh, origins gives meaning. Why was Jesus born? Why did he live? What was the reason for his death? The answer to all that is found in Genesis. It was to redeem human beings who had willfully separated themselves from God. And God could have rightfully said, fine, go to hell. But he did not. He instituted the rescue plan. We wouldn't understand any of that if it weren't for the origin from the book of Genesis. See, if evolution is true, and we just develop naturally, then there's no such thing as sin. If evolution is true, there's no such thing as sin. It's just behaving naturally. So, a savior from sin? What foolishness, right? Yeah. If you're talking to you, the honest skeptic and start with savior from sin, what are you talking about? I, maybe we need to start with a foundation. The doctrine of creation is foundation. The key concept of creation is life. All life comes from a living God both originally, now, and eternity. Death is not our maker. Evolution death is not our maker. Rather, we were formed and fashioned by a living God. Psalm 139, most of you know it well. You formed my inward parts. Genesis and, uh, Genesis and the creation accounts that are found outside of Genesis are really the basis for a number of human doctrines. Human doctrines. Biblical doctrines. All right, let's cut to the chase. Here's the key idea. This is what the controversy between creation and evolution is all about. Who's the authority? Who rules our life? Us? That's what evolution says, right? That's what Charles Darwin said. Matter's the maker, it's us. Or the creator himself. Oh, and by the way, who do you want to believe about origins? Fallible human beings who weren't there? Or the creator himself who brought everything into existence with this word? Uh, all right, here's my practical advice for you. This is my lovely wife, Karen. She is an equine scientist. Here she is with one of our ponies. Here's my hot tip. Pick one evidence. If you want to deal with other folks about creation, evolution, just pick one. And they're going to ask you, well, what about this latest find in Ethiopia? And what about that star up there? And what about the James Webb? And say, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about that. But have you considered the horse's hoof? My wife cracks up all the time. She reads all these things by scientists. They talk about design, 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 design. And then they say, oh, and it just all happened by chance over millions of years. <laughs> no, no. There are so many design characteristics in the horse's hoof that it really does matter. 
Here's the point, by the way. Why are we even considering creation? Here's the only legitimate reason to talk about creation. The only legitimate reason to talk about creation is to point to the creator. The creation apologist removes stumbling blocks and says, hey, you know, this Bible says a lot of interesting things. Oh, okay. Maybe I should read that. Great idea. We don't do this to win battles or to have notches on our belt or anything else. We just do it to point people to Christ, and the creation is a great common ground. If uh, you don't know anything about the horse's hoof, take one of these models. Sit it on your desk. When people ask you what that is, you tell them this is God's signature. And if you want to know how to do that, that's the second presentation. Okay? But take one of these in that little handout, be sure. And, and I got plenty, so you have uh, other friends and children that like one, please do that. All right, so as he goes way over time, I try to do this so there are no questions. Okay. <laughs> Let me remind you of two things. Number one, creation is a reasonable explanation for origins. Unlike what evolutionary scientists want you to believe that this is some kind of it's extremely reasonable explanation for origins. Right? I mean, that's what Paul says. By him, all things were created. Right. And uh, on, I think on the note there are some resources there if you're interested. But if, if you would like to stand up, it's okay. If you have some questions, are we entertaining questions? We are. Okay, good. I'm asking you because I want you guys to answer it. Okay. <laughs> oh, before I do that, I should really thank both Pastor and uh, Mike and the other, everybody. There, so many people do so much to get something like this going. And look at that technology. And I didn't have to do it. I just drove here and talked. That was the easy part. So thank you very much for your help. Questions or comments or sir? Uh, so my question is, where was the Holy Trinity, the Heavenly Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before all creation, like before the creation account? Right. Where where was He existing at uh, that time? Ah. Uh, like well. Thank you. It's always good to start off with an easy question. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. The, the question was, where was the Trinity before the physical creation was brought into existence? Okay. I don't remember the order I did up front. I, that's my I don't know question. <laughs> I mean, we could all speculate, right? First of all, we do know that God has existed before uh, the creation itself. I want to point you to an interesting place. Read Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 is my biblical account of information theory where Solomon personifies wisdom. He talks about wisdom as being brought forth first as the first of all creation. That's not Christ. I think Luther may have thought that. I've got to double check that. But anyway, the Trinity existed from all time, outside of time. I mean, uh, my interpretation is Time is something for us. God does exist outside. Where? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> great question. Yeah. Sounds like a sounds like a great thing to investigate. Thankfully, we're gonna have a lot of time in heaven. <laughs> you got questions? Me too. <laughs> That's a great question. All right.
you know, Genesis 1 to 11 is the same year we have today, and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. everything in the Bible adds up to 6 to 10. You know, how do you know what's right. going on? Right. Great question. The question was, how do we know how long a year was, especially Genesis 1 through 11, or maybe especially pre-flood? Um, let me preface that by saying the age issue is a very difficult issue. What I have discovered is the age issue trips up more Christians than anything else when we talk about origins. As a matter of fact, I'm just dealing with somebody at my congregation who actually teaches at Concordia with me, and he's just not buying it at all. He says, the earth cannot be less than 10,000 years old. It has to be extremely old. The age issue is um, important. It's not directly related to creation, but is very much indirectly related. And Mike, you mentioned that there's been a discussion in the LCMS about the age of the earth, etc. That was certainly implied <coughs> in the 1932 statement that they had there, but it, they didn't come out and say how many years it was. Um, how, how do we do that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry to throw that one out again. If you ask me personally, I do believe that the universe is less than 10,000 and an actual 10,000 years old. The Earth is less. Why don't I say 6,000? Just because as an engineer, we think in powers of 10, so it's less than 10,000 years old. Yeah. Could the Earth be 12,000 years old? It might. Could there be gaps in the genealogies of Genesis 5, 11, and Matthew 1? There could be. Not enough to get us to hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> Absolutely no way. So, I mean, when Archbishop James Usher, and he gets a big rap, but I mean, he was quite the scholar. He didn't pull 4004 BC just out of a hat. He, if you read his book, it's a huge book, by the way. A lot of thought went into that. And Martin Luther thought. Martin Luther railed against the Egyptians saying, those know-nothings, they talk about the dynasty of 10, that's, it's clear from Moses the earth was not in existence before 6,000 years ago. So, yeah, um, I, I would say it is. How can I prove that to people? I'd say you'd have to look at the biblical text. But my second reason is there's nothing scientifically that argues against that. We didn't talk about radiometric dating, but as somebody who's done it, trust me, the answer you get is just the assumption you put in. So, yeah. It's a hard question. And, um, Mike, uh, here's your assignment. This is what professors do. You figure it out, you let me know. <laughs> then the next time I'm asked, <laughs> great question. Did that help at all? I don't know. No. No. Okay, next. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Pastor, sir. That was, uh, I, I appreciated the comments about focusing on the positive things about creation more so than mm-hmm. uh, attacking evolution. But one, one reason that encouraging to me is because I'm surrounded by people like Mike who know so much more about this stuff than I do. I need something simpler <laughs> yeah. I can use. Yeah. But w- would you share a little about how that has worked for you sure. personally? I'm guessing sure. you probably have interacted with yeah. students every year sure. that sure. come in with a yeah. different worldview. Oh, and yeah. And I'm sure colleagues at other universities. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank- so the comment was, uh, Pastor appreciated. If you're going to do what I'm advocating, then start with a positive approach. <clears throat> I will oftentimes get questions about, and this happened not that long ago, where a student said, what about this archaeological find in some place in Africa? You know, it, this is an intermediate form. How do you explain that? And I said, you know, that's just really interesting. I honestly don't know. And that kind of stopped them a little bit, because they, re- they were ready for an argument, right? You know how it is. The Bears are the best football team. He said, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I live in Wisconsin. I'd... What was that guy? Aaron Rodgers? Didn't know that guy. OK. Uh, yeah, so whoa. So that really kind of. And then the next technique that you should do is ask a question. 
how do you know that fossil was an intermediate form? Well, the article in Science News says it was. Okay. Did you, I mean, what evidence did they present? I mean, did the guy just say that or, hmm, well, yeah, it just basically says it before. I said, oh, okay. Well, I don't want to think about that, but have you thought about information theory? <laughs> now, I won't start it like that, but I do have one of these on my desk. I don't remember that. I either pull out a book or I'll pull out one of these models. I'll pull out a book and say, you know about information theory? It's a computer scientist he does. If not, he'll say, no, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, it's the idea that, oh, I just asked, where'd this information come from? Well, the author wrote it. And I said, how do you know? I mean, how do I know? Did you see the author write it? No. Have you met the author? No. How do you, what's well, obvious? I said, you're absolutely right, it's obvious. It's called information theory. Oh, okay. I said, did you know that every one of the 37 trillion cells in your body contains six feet of DNA? And that is all information. I will tell you, the only way that information could have been put into that chemical structure in the beginning is by a master intelligence. An intelligent being much smarter than me. And when I read the biblical text, God says I was the one that did it. So now, you are not going to, you're not going to do information theory. Okay? It's okay. You don't have to. But you pick something that you like. And there are hundreds. Uh, go to the Midwest Creation Fellowship website. You're going to find lots of stuff. These are my two websites. Going there will do you no good. Because, you know, sort of like the cobbler's children have no shoes. The computer scientist never makes a website type of thing. But you'll find, lot, find something that resonates with you. Is it the idea of beauty? Is it the idea of similar structures? Is it the idea of the fossil, you know, whatever it is? And then just have one little thing. And when they ask you, say, nope, I, I'm sorry, I don't know about that. And that's legitimate. That will be very helpful because they'll see that indeed you are a real human being. If the first words out of your mouth are, well, that find was debunked by blah, blah in 2021. Don't, don't even do that. Just say, oh, really, tell me more about that. Let me understand that. And then present your positive case, and now you got a dialogue. And now you could say, I'll think about your case, you think about mine. I don't have time to think about their case, but anyway, <laughs> hopefully they'll think about mine. <laughs> there we go. All right, does that help? <laughs> yeah, good question. Good comment. Anything else? Sir? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Now, did that, was that the first day, or how old was the earth? Right. Alternatively, when you yep. created it. Yep, 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 and that would be a, a common point, wouldn't it? The comment is, you read Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, okay? Is that part of the first day, which is clearly identified in one, uh, verse 3 of chapter 1, right? Mm -hmm. God, um, you'll, again, there'll be theologians that will fall on either side. I will tell you that was part of the first day. Okay. But there are definitely folks, and this is where, and there are creationary scientists and good Christians who will say, no, this is why. The universe could be very, the universe could be very old because God, you know, created the heavens and the earth, and then at some time later, he, he did this stuff on planet earth, right? Okay. That is the way some people read it. Um, I, I read it a little differently. Yeah. And if it helps, I mean, that's the way Martin Luther read it too. Okay. <laughs> Bring out the, yeah, great, great comments, so that's just the way I look at it. <laughs> I, okay. All right. Now, again, I don't know. I don't know everything. I make mistakes. I'm going to tell you that this, what God, for the earth, God say made some kind of watery mass. God made some kind of big ball of water. Okay. The spirit was hovering over the surface of the deep. Obviously implies water there. So it didn't look like planet earth. No. 
We know that because the dry land came out later, right? That was day three. God separated the waters above from waters below and pulled two. Uh, pulled out the dry land. Plants on day three. I guess you already had to have it. So yeah. So separated the waters above from waters below on day two. Pulled out the dry land then, I think. I guess I should know what I'm talking about. So yeah, what it, it didn't look like earth today, right? He still was in the process of both forming through days one, two, three, and filling in days four, five, and six. Yeah. Good comment. Sir? So, if you have a good question, how old was it when it was made? Mm -hmm. It's something that, I mean, obviously, when it was made, it was brand new. Right. But God made man and woman yep. without babies. So yep. everything he made had what we would see as an age. Yes. Uh, so trees would probably have rings, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's not lying. It's not that God was lying. Right. There was, right. Uh, it looks like there was history. Right, right. And I know this, is, so it's a great comment. The comment is, when things were created by God, my term is fully functional. They were ready to run. When, at, how old did Adam and Eve look on day seven when they were one day old? The answer is, we usually, until I got to be really old, I don't think they looked in their 60s, okay? But when I was 20, they kind of looked 20, and then when I was 30, I said, nah, I'm smart. They were in the 30. They certainly didn't look like they were one day old, right? Absolutely. Now, the one thing I don't, and thanks for not using the term, some people use the term appearance of age. God created maturity, things that were fully formed and functional. The idea of appearance of age, and then the folks say, well, then God was trying to fool us. No, not at all. He said, created a fully mature, there were trees with fruit on it. Exactly. So yeah, how old did that look? Yeah, it didn't look like it was a seed. Absolutely. Great comment. Thank you for that. Sir? Kind of not the same thing. I think it's a slam dunk that God created those six literal days, 24 hour days. Mm -hmm. But is, are there any theologians who believe that God created the six literal days that also believe that the earth is hundreds of thousands of millions of years old? Good question. So, first of all, the comment is. Uh, six days seems like a slam dunk, I agree. But are there any theologians who say God created six days, yet the universe is very old? The gap concept is there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So God created heavens and the earth, enormous amount of time. And then at some time later, God focused attention on planet earth in Genesis 1-2. It's called the gap idea. So yes, there are people who do accept that that you have a very ancient universe, but yet a relatively recent uh, Earth. Okay. So just a gap theory. Right, yeah, L look up gap theory. Mm -hmm. That will help you find those folks. Um, no, because the gap is really between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, so the universe could be very old, but Earth is still young. Now, those theologians that want to have a long period of time for Genesis 1, that would be the day age, the evolutionary creationary crowd, the Francis Collins people who say, yeah, God created, but did so over hundreds of millions of years. And, yeah. mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, command decision. We're going to stop now because you need to stand up and you're probably hungry too. So I'd be happy to talk to you individually or you might want to eat too. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate it. Okay, what are we doing right there? Okay, that one down. We'll get the next one ready sometime. <laughs>